a time is coming when you're going to be beheaded. Beheaded for Jesus. Uh, oh, and on that note, <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to Unraveled Hearts Bible Study. We were in the thick of a really good discussion. You can only imagine. We're talking about offering and sacrifice and all of that. It was getting really good. But we got to get started. And if you happen to be uh, watching us right now, it was meant to be. You need to plug in. You will learn something. I promise you. We're going to be in the book of Numbers. We do a little bit of Proverbs, book of Numbers. And you're not going to uh, get, you know, you're really going to get something from the Old Testament that maybe you hadn't gotten before. I believe that. I believe that God will, will show you something different, that God will speak to you through um, the book of Numbers. Chapter 28 is what we're doing today. I also want to encourage you to look at our events. I will be putting some updates on our events. But I, I want you to look at our page. I want you to stay updated later, you know, when we're done. Look at it and see what is going on because we're a, a, a living, thriving a ministry and there are things happening and we want you to be plugged in with us. We would welcome that. I want you to also, if you could please comment where you're watching from. You know, if you're watching from Texas, if you're watching from Ohio, from Virginia, um, wherever you are, Kansas, put on there where you're watching from. Um, that would be really good. And then like, if you want to say I'm in my closet, I'm in my car, you know, whatever, that's fine. Um, and, and communicate with one another because if you engage with one another, that's what it's all about too. Building community because we're going to focus on the word of God and we're not necessarily going to be looking at our phones as a matter of fact. We shut our phones and they are put away. We'll look at any questions that you may have later. But we're going to jump right in to the book of Proverbs. We start with Proverbs. What chapter are we on? And everybody said 11. 11 verse 20. Okay. All right, Honda, can you read that, please? <laughs> Those of crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord, but those of blameless ways are His delight. Okay, and that's kind of what we were talking about. We're gonna we're gonna unpack this, and, and it's gonna let's let's see where we go here. So we do that by going to the Geneva Bible, the King James, and the New Living Translation. Some of you may be brand new to 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 our live or to this Bible study. So I want to let you know why we go through the Geneva King James and uh, New Living Translation. The Geneva was the first study Bible ever um, translated. And they actually, they hid away. They, they got away from the government and from the church, the Roman Catholic Church. They hid away and they translated the Bible so that common people could read it for themselves and not have to go to a priest, not have to go to someone who would tell them what it was because it was just in Latin at that time. So it needed to be translated in English. The Geneva Bible is the reason why you have numbers in your Bible, why they're separated by chapter and verses. And then the King James, King James did not want to be behind, did not want to be outdone by the Geneva Bible, which actually came to the US in the Mayflower. So King James got scholars together for two years. They debated on the translation. They pulled, they, they uh, poured over the translation. And then you have the Geneva and the King James that are very similar. So that just tells you how much, uh, how great the Geneva Bible was at that at, at that time. It still is. It, it, the Geneva and the King James, solid translations, very close to the Hebrew and the Greek. But we're also going to look at the New Living Translation, and that's just common, common language, common folk type of of, uh, of English writing. So it helps us. It helps us understand. If you want to study the Word of God, that's where you would go first to kind of give you a general, a, a good understanding of what's going on, and then you could pursue other translations that go a little bit deeper. Okay, so the Geneva verse 20 of chapter 11 in Proverbs says, they that are a froward heart 
are abomination, big, mean word to the Lord. But they that are upright in their way are his delight, okay? What does froward mean? We, can, we still use that sometimes, but it is mostly an old English word. Um, not really used anymore, but what is, and we've mentioned it before. So, froward. Do you remember? What does that sound like? Sad. Like a frown. Frown, right? What, people who always have a frown on their face, are they, <laughs> you know, <laughs> some people are saved, but they haven't told their face. What what is it about people who have a front on their face? What do you think of them sometimes? If we're being honest. I don't want to deal with that person. I don't want to have anything to do with that person because you don't know they're they're in a foul mood, right? To be flowered means people who are contrary. They're difficult. Okay? No matter what, it'll be really hard to, to please them even if you try. Um, but people who are contrary, that means if, you know, you tell them, hey, um, it's going to be a great day today. No, it's not. And we're going to have this for dinner. Why? I hate that. No matter what it is, they're the kind of people that they're always like, um, I want to say Debbie Downers, but even worse than that, they're contrary. They're just difficult. You know, they don't get along with people. So this is what God is saying about someone like this. Worse that it's on their face because sometimes, you know, we have our face and we realize, hey, you know, that's not really how I'm feeling. But these people actually are feeling that in their heart. Their heart is froward, the word of God says. And they are an abomination to the Lord. What does abomination mean? Isn't there a cartoon? It's horrible. I just had a thought about that. Uh, abomination. What does it mean? If something is an abomination, well, but but what it it's, it causes disgust. You disgust me. There's hatred. There's loathing. Okay. So watch this. A contrary heart disgusts God. Okay. That's not me saying it. That's the word of God saying it. Okay. So now the rest of the proverb says. Upright, upright, but an upright person. What's an upright person? If you had an upright person as a neighbor, what would what would describe them? What would that look like? Joyful, you mean? Okay. Honest, reputable, respectful, virtuous. Okay. Honorable. And... God says that they're a delight. What's a delight? If someone is a delight, when you like being around them, what is that like? When someone's a delight, they're pleasing. They bring you great joy. They captivate you. Okay? So upright people. So by our translation, an honorable person is pleasing to the Lord. Okay? And then King James is exactly the same, the same translation. So we're not going to go into that. But the Living Bible, the New Living Translation says, The Lord detests people with a crooked heart, but he delights in those with integrity. So a few words, detest. What's, what's the definition of detest? If you detest something, whoa. What would it be? I don't just simply, I don't like spaghetti. I detest spaghetti. What's the difference? You hate it. You hate it. Yeah. So you loathe it. You despise. I don't think it's possible to be able to despise pasta, but I don't know. But I'm giving you an example. Despise. What is a crooked heart? What does it mean when someone's crooked? Like you hear a crooked cough or manipulative or mm -hmm. um, it's part deceiving. Of it, yeah. Deceitful, <clears throat> twisted, dishonest. Okay? And then it brings up integrity. Honesty. 
Someone, in, someone who has integrity. What, what's the definition of that? Someone who's honest, good character, okay? So, uh, people with deceitful hearts are despised by God. Does that sound powerful or what? Yeah. People with deceitful hearts are despised by God. And we have deceitful, I mean, deceitful people in our government. They are despised by God. God takes joy from people who are sincere. God takes joy from people who are sincere. Okay? I would, could I ask you to, to just turn off the fan? Yeah, it's giving me the sneezes and people are going to freak out. Okay. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I'm glad I'm all high. Okay. So, what great treasure, let's talk about that. That was sincere. Okay. <laughs> so, what great treasure do you get from this verse? Okay, think about this verse, and I'm going to ask you a deeper question. Was there a time, now when you look at this verse, and we're real honest, and we look at it, and we just said it how it is, was there a time in your life when you were an abomination to God? Mm -hmm. Think about that. When your heart was contrary to God, and I think... It's so it's such powerful and harsh language, or, or we think of it now in this you know very superficial, easily offended world that we live in. So this is a powerful language. So then when we say something like that, we're like I don't I don't want to say that I was an abomination of God. But if you were ever, and we all were, because you had to come to Jesus, you were full of sin, you had to repent. That's how you came to Jesus. If you haven't, that's you've got to repent. You've got to change, uh, change your mind. So, at one point, we were all an abomination to God because our heart was contrary. It was difficult. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, a time when we didn't bring delight. To God's heart. I want you to think about that. Because it's real easy now on, on this side of the cross, on maybe a completely transformed life, to look at someone and go, How dare they? How can't don't they see? They don't see. You didn't see. Right? So we need to be careful with that and understand that yes, they're abom they're an abomination of God. But that can change. That can change if they if they come to, to know the Lord, if they come to Jesus. How about this? Are you sensitive to the Holy Spirit when it comes to displeasing God? Because he Holy Spirit is this like radar inside of us that we may not even know, especially when you're a young believer, you don't know what that is. You know, I just feel funny here. It doesn't feel the same. I feel wrong about this. I didn't feel wrong before, but now it feels wrong. And, and that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit inside of you. It's the Holy Spirit, you know. Greet, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is sensitive to God's presence. So anytime you're somewhere you're not supposed to be, or doing something you're not supposed to be doing, Holy Spirit bubbles up inside of you. And starts whispering to you. And you realize, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. So are you sensitive to that? Are you sensitive to the Holy Spirit when it comes to displeasing God? I feel like you have a story right about to come out. I don't know. No? You're going to keep it inside. Okay. <laughs> okay. But her face is like shining. Like, oh. So, you know, and, and, um, she's just ready to, 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 to burst out. But no, you're not going to. Okay. <laughs> so that's called, what is that called? When the Holy Spirit does that. Yeah. Honda said. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say, Honda? Conviction. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Conviction. Conviction. Okay. We are 
tracking with Holy Spirit because I heard Michelle say a little while ago, this is about a heart check. And that's exactly what I was thinking when I was doing it. This is a heart check moment. I think we're living in a heart check time, okay? Is your heart contrary to God? Is your heart contrary to God? The hamster wheel that we all are on keeps us from avoiding this question, okay? Our demanding schedules with jobs on top of, of other stuff, on top of everything else, because for the most part, this is um, a nation, like on top of your schedule, you've got your kids' schedule, so because we're a nation that worships our children, okay, other nations don't, the children respect their parents, and they just follow suit, but in the U.S., for the most part, we bend over backwards for our kids, and sometimes we, we have to be careful with that because we end up worshiping our kids. So we have our schedule, and we have their schedule, uh, to worship something uh, or to make it an idol means you put it before God, okay? Even our own kids' schedules dictate our time. So as long as you're going, 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 you don't have time to check your heart. You don't have time to reflect on purpose. You don't have time to think about destiny. You don't have time to ponder and think about why you were created, why you exist in the first place. You don't have time. You don't have time to even think generationally. How is this gonna affect generations that are gonna come through me? But now you do. <laughs> now you do, and most of you don't like it. Some of you women don't even know what to do with yourselves, much less what to do with your children right now. This is a time for a heart check, okay? Let's go to Jeremiah 17, 9. Jeremiah 7, one of my favorite prophets. Who has that, by the way? Did I give that to anybody? Oh, no, I didn't because I was probably. Okay, Jeremiah 17, 9. Who got there already? If you got there, can you go ahead and read it out loud, please? The heart is deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Yes. That is the, the verse for this ministry. That's a great, you know, uh, foundational verse to start a ministry. And, and I did. It unraveled hearts comes from that verse. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? There are times you can't even trust your own heart. So, women, time to realize that your heart can be contrary to God without even knowing it because you're so preoccupied with everything else in your life, okay? Even now, when the focus should be inward, this is a time to look inwardly, getting strong spiritually, spending time to talk with God, fortifying your home, strengthening your marriage, enjoying your family, getting much needed rest, thinking and reflecting when that's where the focus should be. Some of you are spending this time on your devices, on your screens, getting the latest lies and hysteria, worrying and getting anxious or nervous. Let's check our hearts. Are they in line with God's heartbeat? Let's become his delight. Let's bring him joy. Let's please God with our lives right now. Let's go to Matthew 317. Matthew 317. Michelle, you there? And there came a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. I take delight in him. Hallelujah. I like that, that it, that yours says delight. It falls right in line with what we were saying. 
Um, other translations say, I am well pleased. Okay? I want you to know that this is when Jesus got baptized. And all of a sudden, and there's the Gospels all depicted just a tiny bit different. Some say Holy Spirit came like a dove. That doesn't mean a dove. Um, others say a voice from heaven. Others say, you know, the, the heavens open up. Just a little slightly different. But the point is, it's all the same. God is saying, this is my son who I am well pleased. I want you to know that he had not started his ministry yet. He had done nothing yet. So it's not about doing. This is, this is a hard concept for women to get. It's not about doing. It's not your constant activity or actions that will cause God to say, oh my good and faithful daughter who brings me delight, rather your pure heart, your spirit, and your mind, loving and trusting God in obedience. Okay? How about that for cheese and crackers? We're going to go right into the book of Numbers now. We're going to go to our meat and potatoes, Numbers 28. And we're going to pray before we get started on this, uh, sorry, on this part of the study. It's such a, a peaceful night. It's such a beautiful spirit. I just feel the presence of God already here in Aurora's home and just the women that are gathered here. Let me just pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you because amidst us trying to figure ourselves out, amidst us having a contrary heart, being confused, being nervous, allowing things around us to dictate how we feel amidst all of that you're still trying to speak to us you're still trying to woo our hearts you're still trying to lead us to truth it's quite incredible god i thank you i thank you for your presence even now god i pray father god that your presence becomes so thick that we can feel it, that your cloud, that is your presence just comes over us right now, that we're able to understand and know you in a way that we never have before. Father God, we just want to bear our hearts and our minds before you. We want to give you access to every part of us, God, so that you can begin that heart surgery that you need in us. We want to give you this time to check our hearts, God. I pray, God, for everyone here and within the sound of my voice that will not be distracted by anything, that their focus will be completely you and your word right now, God. Please, God, I pray, Father God, for you to ban every distraction for our minds and our hearts right now. In Jesus' name. I thank you, God. Holy Spirit, lead us into all truth. Amen and amen. So, Numbers 28. Anybody care to recap? Where did we go? How far did we get last week? Do you remember? <laughs> we just set the stage for the chapter. We didn't go far at all um, because we we went we did a lot of work biblically, but it was all to set the groundwork. So we're going to do a lot of digging today. This is important because I realize that a lot of women have not studied the book of Leviticus, have not studied the book of Exodus. So I love that chapter 28 is right here for us. For God is saying, hey, remember, hey, don't forget. He's telling us with this chapter. So I want you to think about kind of what we, we talked about last week. If there's anything else from even chapter 27 that you want to bring up, I want to give a few minutes to that to kind of center your mind around what we're about to study. What did we bring up last, uh, last uh, Bible study? 
about chapter 28. Do you, you remember? No, nothing. Okay, that's not good. <laughs> we need to chew on, we wanna become good ground, right? We don't wanna be the type that we just get the word of God poured over us and the minute we walk out the door, it just flies out of our head or birds come and eat it. Unbelievers just say one thing and everything is gone. We wanna be the type that will get a, a word and we'll chew on it, we'll chew on it, we'll think about it, we'll go to the Father about it, we'll, we'll keep looking into it because that means that you're good ground. And when you're good ground, those seeds can begin to grow. Okay, we wanna become that. But basically, I, I went on the premise that what, what kind of sacrifices or what kind of offerings did they give to God? Or what were they supposed to do? Do you remember what kind of offerings were given to God or he was requiring of them? Was it dollars, euros? What was it? Do you remember? Animals, animals, okay? So we learn that animals were given because animals had to die. They had to be sacrificed. They had to be offered. Why? Why did that have to happen? Why was there bloodshed? What? Sin. Sin. Sin equals what? Disobedience. Death. Death. Right? Yeah. Disobedience equals death. When did all this start? When did God implement this? Did God start this? When did it all? Why did animals have to die? Adam and Eve. What happened, Honda? They sinned. And what and what what was what was different? What did they notice about each other? They recognized they, they were saw. naked. Yes! Oh, they're awake, they're alive. I promise you there's people here. <laughs> okay? They recognized that they were naked. And what happens when you realize you were naked? Maybe not necessarily physically, but in the spiritual. When you begin to realize that you are vulnerable, you put on superficial things that make people think that you're okay, you're covered. They put on fig leaves to cover themselves. That was not sufficient. God knew that, they didn't know that. They, they had just sinned. They were in a dumb moment, okay? But what does God do? What does God do before he tells them, okay, now you have a different kind of life. He had what over them? He had love, yes. compassion, mercy. Yeah, but what? how did he cover them? The animal, skin. the animal skins. They had to be covered. He covered their sin. And in order for that to happen, what? how do you get skin from an animal? The animal has to what? Die. 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 Okay? Fast forward to now. How does God cover our sin? Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Okay? He was our sacrifice. At that time, they didn't have that. They didn't have Jesus. So why did, and, and why did the Israelites, why would they even have to offer up animal sacrifices? Okay? I know there's a lot of women going, oh my gosh, no. How could that be? Animal rights people and all that up in arms. Why? First of all, I just told you it was not God's plan at all. Man did this. And then second of all, why did this have to happen constantly? Why is it something they had to do? What? <laughs> Cause loud so you can hear. <laughs> cannot be with oh. someone full of sin. Okay, that person will die. You cannot be around a holy God if you have sin in your life. Okay? 
So there has to be death, blood, something to cover that. And so in that, in that time, they used animals. Now, how long would that animal, you know, because he wanted to be a God that was in their midst. He wanted to be a God that he's a relate. He's all about relationship. When it was with Adam, he used to walk with Adam. He wanted to be with his creation. He still desires that, but we're the ones that pulled away, not him. So he had to make a way. He had to make a way back to us, right? He had to find a way. So here with the animals that kept God to be in their midst, for a long time or a short time, only until you sinned again. Only until you had another bad thought or you lied or you did something, you know? I think if, if I were to live in that time, like I'd be going there every day, goat after goat, you know? I buy go mine otra vez. You know, it's just like they could know, oh my God, what did he do this time? What did she do this time? They, everybody would see you go, you know? And we we used to have for a very short time because we're terrible animal people. Uh, we had a ram, a ram, a, a lamb and a, and a ram, right? Oh, yeah, male and, and a female. And every time I put my head on that ram, you could just feel just the power of it, the life of it. When they would offer these sacrifices, these animals to God, they had to put their hand on the head of the animal to realize the extent so that they would realize, man, what I did, like this animal that is powerful, it's very much alive, it, nothing is wrong with this animal, and yet this animal has to die because of something I did. They felt that, there was this moment of, transfer you're transferring your sin to this animal and now this animal is gonna die so i bet and those animals they lived with constantly they you they used them for everything they were not expendable they needed them for everyday stuff and i'm sure just like we get attached to our animals they got attached you know that's bertha that's emmanuel that's whoever you know billy bob the goat whatever they would name them. They would, maybe the kids got attacked. Oh no, we have to give it up. Or maybe that was your only mode of transportation. I, you know, depending on who it was. So it meant something. It was a powerful act. It wasn't, they, were, they weren't just like, oh, okay, here, have my goat. It was something that was powerful. They didn't want to sin, but it was inevitable because we're people and we're full of sin and Nothing, nothing except the blood of Jesus can wash us white as snow. So this is what was happening, okay? And so they knew that. The, the, the Israelites that came out of Egypt knew that. But why is God saying everything all over again? Well, not everything, but the, the most important part about the sacrifice and the offerings and all of this. Why is he saying it again? This is very important. What, the first generation is what? Dead. They're dead. Their bones are in the wilderness because they didn't believe God. So now it's the kids. Everything that God had taught them through Moses, they were like five years old. If you can think of the five-year-olds at church running around, you know, uh, going under mom and daddy's feet or in between their legs, just kind of peeking through or just... They're not grasping everything. They're not, unless the parents teach them as they're growing. But we know that this generation was a rebellious generation. They weren't necessarily the ones to pass this down. We're hoping that they did to some extent, but now Moses is bringing it up to all of these who are now adults. They're adults. And God is reminding them, he's saying, I'm gonna give you the promised land, but when, again, God is a God of when. He's not a God of if. If I give the promised land, he's a, when you go to the promised land, then you're going to do these offerings. You're going you're gonna to do these offerings, and this is how you're going to do them, and this is when you're going to do them. He was very specific. Another thing to note, why was God very specific? 
Why was God so specific? What was he doing with these animals and these rituals and all of this? Preparing them. He was preparing them for what? He was painting what? Jesus. He was painting a picture of Jesus. Thank you, Melba, for feeding her responses. But yeah, so you don't have to cheat. You just have to say what's on your mind, and we'll talk about it. But so, so yeah, he's painting a picture of Jesus with, with their lives, with what they do. That's why it was very important that if God said, do this and this and this, that they did it exactly that way. Because thousands of years later, when someone looked at that picture and then Jesus came on the scene, they would connect the dots. Oh my gosh, this sacrifice symbolized Jesus, that he is the Lamb of God. And if they messed that up, if they did their own thing and messed up those pictures, what would happen? They wouldn't be able to recognize Jesus. They didn't anyway but later on we have Paul who um, and, and so many other Christians who are able to show us who are able to reach the Jews by showing them Old Testament and Jesus's life and how those correlate so lots lots of good stuff there I absolutely love love um, learning about this and hopefully I can teach it in a way that you can understand or get something powerful from it we're going to start with verse 1 and 2 in Numbers. Gianna, can you read verse 1 and 2 in Numbers chapter 28? And the Lord said, Give this command to the Israelites and say to them, Make sure that you present it to me at the appointed time, my food offering as an aroma pleasing to me. Okay. Mela, can you read one and two again? I just want you to hear the different translations. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Command the children of Israel and say to them, My offering, my food for my offerings made by fire as a sweet aroma to me. You shall be careful to offer to me at their appointed time. Okay. We're going to go through this verse. We're going to go through uh, one and two. But just in two... It is so loaded with Jesus that I want you, as we go through it, as we go through it, that you underline like the things that represent Jesus, just with verse two, okay? That's as far as we're gonna get today. It is so loaded, okay? So verse one, verse one tells us that everything we're about to receive came directly from God, okay? giving this new generation instructions of what is expected of them once they reach the promised land, okay? Several things to note in verse 2 right away, straight away. We are going to dissect this verse, and I'm going to point out to you so you can see everything in this verse God is talking about points to Jesus, okay? So verse 2 already is Jesus revealed, okay? It's always been one story from beginning to end. It's always been about Jesus, okay? First of all, in verse two, I want you to note where it says, the children of Israel, okay? This is important for you to take note of because the information and these instructions went to all the people okay not just the priest or not this was not for the priest meaning the offering type and the way um was not for the priest to decide it was the lord's offering okay the priests were just part of the process they ministered to the people and they made sure that the offering was inspected and done correctly so that it would be received by God, okay? But the ministers, okay, the priests, were not the ones to put restrictions or discriminate the worshipers because a person making the offering was called a worshiper, okay? 
Offering something to God is an act of worship, right? So today, an offering is whatever God puts in an individual's heart, okay? God speaks to us. He speaks to the person, not to the leaders on how or how much they are to give, okay? Track with me on this, okay? Keep in mind, we already studied this uh, a while back, tithing and specific offerings. Animal offerings were done away with through Jesus. I want to make sure, like, I don't want you to be sitting there and go, what? If I become a Christian, I have to, like, kill my goat or something? No, no, no. Like, they were done away with Jesus, all right? And, and, and here's the thing. The, Churches a lot of times struggle with this today. The fact that all of that, the tithing, the offering, they were done away with in Jesus. They were completed in Jesus. Offerings now come entirely from the heart, okay? So a lot of times, it's, it's funny because I see this over and over where um, you have a lot, of especially, you know, non-denominational or just charismatic, I don't know, just modern pastors or, or, or preachers. And they love the New Testament and they talk about how antiquated this is and they don't really get into it except when it comes to tithing. They're happy to get into Malachi when it comes to tithing and they're happy to talk about that. But you got to understand that that is all done with. By you going back there and limiting people to 10%, you're limiting your work, you're limiting your church because it's actually now 100%. Everything belongs to God. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking to someone and you're saying, oh, you know, we can't wait for you to give that 10%, that's what you need to do. And God is saying like, I want you to give all, I want you to give this. Then you're going to be like conflicting with what God's telling them and what with you think you want to say, because you want to make sure like the, and I have a pastor here. So, you know, I want you to know that I'm saying this in front of a pastor that the, a lot of times we think, oh, but how is God going to take care of our church? So then this is lack of faith on pastors a lot of times that say, well, if everybody gives 10%, we'll be okay. Our light will stay on. Our bills will get paid. By you saying, you know what? You give what God tells you. And you let God work. And God is limitless. And he might be telling someone to be giving $9,000 a month. And here you're like... You know, give ninety dollars a month. You know, you're limiting what God can do through them. You know, so so and 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 also not trusting God in the process of that. Everything belongs to God, but it is a heart issue. Okay, Second Corinth. Let me show you why it's a heart issue giving now. And this is kind of what we were talking about. I don't know. You brought these things up. You were ahead of the game right here. Second Corinthians nine six through seven. Who has that? 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7. Okay. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Or not under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. Okay. Does that make sense, Aurora, now that you read it? Where it says, let everyone, let each of you give as he has purposed in his heart. What God puts in your heart. Okay. And it says, God loves a cheerful giver. So you do it with a good heart. With, you know, you are pleased to do it. It gives you joy to do it. Okay? All right. And watch this. Mark 12. Mark 12, 41 through 44. Who has that? Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow 
has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Wow. Okay. And here's where we were talking about, you know, the sacrifice, sacrificial giving as opposed to, you know, maybe not $9,000 for you is pocket change. It's no big deal. It's not going to make a dent in your bank account. So it's not, it, it doesn't even hurt. It doesn't even, it, it, it doesn't even feel like, you know, a sacrifice and offering. Yet $90 for someone, that's their grocery money. That's, you know, that's something that, you know, here you go. And they're just trusting God with it. See how that is giving from their, their lack, their whole livelihood, okay? Um, so God values the heart behind the, the, the giving, okay? Not just the gift, but the giver, okay? And I was thinking about Unraveled Heart. Because throughout this whole journey, I've been so blessed with so many generous people, giving hearts um, that are so kind, and I just, uh, I'm overwhelmed by it. And everybody gives differently. There's no, I can't pinpoint, well, that one gives more, this one, you know, because at, at, a, at a certain time, someone has given for an event. At a certain time, someone has opened their doors and I don't take that lightly. They, they give from their, you know, groceries. They give from their time, their effort to, to have the house clean, to arrange their family so that we can be here. I mean, it is work and it is from their heart that that's done. That's not a light thing to just host people in your home. And then I think of others who are support right now I have three that are supporting me on a monthly basis you know i that is just that blows my mind that's so kind of them that helps that is very helpful uh, i have people that have given of their things have given, when it's someone needed something um there's just so many different ways that someone has helped in one way or another given in different ways that's the way it should be. There's not a specific way. It's just as long as when you are teaching the word of God and when God begins to do surgery in people's hearts, then they become giving because the spirit of God is in them. And the spirit of God is a generous God. He wants to be, he wants to use you as a vessel. He wants to flow through you. And so, um, so if, if you're doing that as a leader, as a pastor, if you're teaching people the word of God, let God take care of the heart thing and you'll see how they'll soon become a river, a river and they will, they will be giving and they will be helpful. God does a transformation and then God will speak to them. Um, so um, this is quite, a, this is a good, a good, uh, uh, I want you to have a good understanding of the offering now. Okay, we're talking about Old Testament. That's why we're talking about animals. But now it's giving everything belongs to God. You know, you fool yourself if you think you own anything. If you've given your life to God, like everything belongs to God. Okay, here we go. Now, the next thing I want you to know from Numbers 28 is my offering. In verse, in verse 2, if you have that, you know, underline it where it says my offering. This is God speaking, okay? The word offering here comes from the root Hebrew word meaning karab, karab, which means to come near, okay? The offering would allow the Israelites to come near to God. If they brought an animal, they brought a sacrifice, now they were able to come near to him, okay? That is what he's always desired about creation, he used to walk with Adam. God desires to be in relationship with us, but sin keep us, keeps us from being near to him or being able to approach him. Let's go to Isaiah 59.2. And go ahead and read it. Isaiah 59.2. Who has Who has it? But your iniquities have separated you 
from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that you will, so he will not hear. Okay. This is very important for you under, to understand. If you have sin in your life, you are separated from God. This is my gripe with all these, you know, Instagram verses and um, all of these verses going on Facebook that you're saying, our God, you know, will take care of us. Our God is our protector. Our... Yes, but for people who have surrendered their life to Jesus, who are not living in sin, who are obeying God. So that's very important to know. We tend to leave that out. So it, this, Isaiah's reminding, we're separated from God because of our sin, okay? But an offering would allow the Israelites to come near to God, for God to be in their midst, his presence among them, but just for a short time. That is why continual offerings had to be given all the time, okay? Now we can all draw near to God, but we still need an offering. Because our sin, what is sin equal to? Death. Death. So we have the perfect offering, and the perfect offering is Jesus forevermore. We can only go to God through Jesus, okay? Through his blood that he offered up for us. It, it, it has to be through a sacrifice. But the, the beauty about that is that Jesus already became the perfect sacrifice. But you still have to accept that. And you have to give that, um, come to God through that. Jeremiah 30, 22. Jeremiah 30, 22. You shall be my people and I will be your God. Okay. That is his desire for us. He wants us to, he wants to be our God. Let's go to Ephesians 1 7. Ephesians. Uh, 1 7. Who has that? We have redemption in him through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Okay. In him we have redemption through what? His what? We have redemption through his what? Blood. Blood. Okay? Isaiah 53, 5. Oh, I read somebody's. <laughs> I didn't know we were going to. <laughs> That's okay. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our tra transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Okay. Okay. So that's just showing us a picture of Jesus. Jesus paid it all. He was crucified as a perfect sacrifice for us. Okay. That's why we needed the blood of Jesus. So through Jesus, we can draw near to God. We can communicate directly to the Father. We become a friend of God, a child of God. We can call God Daddy. The only way we can come near to God is through Jesus, and that is why he offered himself uh, up as a perfect sac sacrifice. He became our offering so that we could come near to God. Hebrews 7.25 Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore, he is always able to save those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. Okay. He is able to save us. My translation says, to the uttermost, those who come to God through him. We sometimes neglect that. See how it says, through him. You can only come to God through whom? Jesus. Jesus. Through him. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is praying for us. Jesus is constantly doing that for us as well. This is beautiful. And then in verse 2, Numbers 28, verse 2, there's a some wording there that says, My bread in the Geneva 
and the King James, it says my bread. In other translations, it might say my food, okay? But it's actually the correct translation or, or the, the, the best translation there is my bread, okay? And this is God speaking. He's saying those offerings you're going to bring are my bread. But watch this. The, the Hebrew word is lechem, which means food more accurately, my bread. This points to Jesus, the bread of life. Jesus himself revealed that when he walked on earth. John 6, 48. Who has that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John 6, 48. Go there even if you don't have it, so you can follow along. Okay, John 6, 48. I am the bread of life. Oh, yeah, you got an echo. I am the bread of life. Who's saying this? Jesus. Jesus. He's revealing himself. He's like walking around and I am the bread of life. These guys had studied all of this. They had this memorized. And here's a man who's saying, I am, like they should have known. Wait a minute, that's Jesus. Okay? He, here he's showing this. This is why God is saying all of these things. Okay? Um, da, 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 da. Then he says, my sacrifices. These are not, watch this, they're not your sacrifices. They're my sacrifices, says the Lord. Why would he say that? Okay? So first of all, we talked about sacrifice. And let me tell you real quick, uh, we're not going to go there, but it, the story is in 2 Samuel um, chapter 24, okay? And so this is where David, who is king, and he messes up a lot of times. That's why I really love that the Bible doesn't hide the junk, all the, 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 the bad stuff. It shows people, you know, flawed people. So David, he says, we're going to go into battle. He gets his leaders and he says, go count all the people. But God had already told him, you do not count your military. Okay? And you say, why the heck not? It makes sense. How can you strategize if you don't count the people? Because God said, no, no, no. You're going to depend on me, not the number of people that you have. You're going to depend on me. So he said, well, count them anyway. He told the leaders, go count them. They came back, and as soon as they had the total population of the military, David was like, oh, man, I messed up. I grieved the, you know, he, he realized he grieved God because the spirit, the spirit of the Lord, it says a lot of times was on him. He could sense that. He could say, man, I messed up. So then he, God sends a prophet, and he says um, to this prophet, tell him he's got three choices. How does David want to be spanked? Does he want to be spanked with locust, eating all his crops? Does he want to be spanked with years of famine? Does he want to be spanked with a military coming and killing them or getting them captive? So David is like, send the, send the, the, ah, send the, the pestilence, the, the, what's happening in Africa right now? Locust. Oh, locust. Send that because yeah. <laughs> rather rather you are in control of that. Um, you are in control, God. But if I don't trust man, so do that instead. We'll take it. And so he does that. And then so many people die. About 70, 70,000 in the military night. Okay. And then he says to, he, he, um, he says, okay, God, how can I make this go away? And the prophet tells him, go and make an altar at the threshing floor of such and such man, or Oram, or something, the name escapes me right now. But he goes, he has to go there, you know, with his wars. And a threshing floor is where the wheat, that's a whole other sermon, the wheat gets placed, and then an ox steps on it. So now the grain comes off the shaft, uh, comes off the wheat. A lot of times it's by beating it. Women had to beat it out, you know, and all the grain would come out. So he has to go there and make an altar for God, and God will stop the plague. Okay, so he gets there, 
and a guy's, you know, doing his work, doing, you know, doing uh, th uh, what you do at a threshing floor. He's he's doing the work, and David shows up. King David shows up to your farm, to your place of work, and he's like, "Oh my gosh, King David, what are you doing here?" And he's like, "Well, I need to buy this." He said, "No, no, no it's yours. It's all yours. The oxen, everything here. It's all yours. You're the king." And David says something that I will never forget, and that I hope you don't either. He says, I will never offer anything to God that doesn't cost me anything. He said, I'm going to pay you for everything. And he paid him. So, a sacrifice costs, okay? An offering to God should cost something. Don't ever offer anything to God that doesn't cost you something. There's a cost attached to it. So, uh, and there's a great missionary that said it doesn't cost, uh, it doesn't cost much to follow Jesus. It just costs everything. Okay, so think on that. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. John three sixteen. We know this. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Okay, God gave Him. Okay, it was a sacrifice. It was His first Son. We don't even want like my mom. If you say anything negative against her heathen son. So go, oh my God, no! You know? But here's the perfect Lamb of God. Per and God just offers him up, humbles him, having to come through a woman and having to have this limited body. And, and he offers him up. So, this was, but this was so necessary. Hebrews 9.22. Hebrews 9.22. Let's go there now. Who's got that one? Hebrews 9.22. Okay, whoever's there, can you please read it? Alora, can you read that when you're there? That'll put some pressure on <laughs> Hebrews 9.22. Okay, okay. In fact, we can say that according to the law of Moses, nearly everything Okay, Hebrews 9, chapter 9, verse 22. Is it, are you there? Is it Hebrews 9, 22? Is it? That's 21. 21. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay
our God. So where they were putting the offering, that animal, God, which is a consuming fire, was eating that, that uh, offering up, consuming it, okay? God was taking it. So, and consuming off offerings made by fire, Jesus himself would be completely consumed as an offering on that cross. That is why we won't be Isaiah 43, 2. Who has that? Me. Go ahead. Go ahead, Arona. 43, 2. So that's a beautiful verse for you to like write and put on your mirror or somewhere to remind yourself though those things happen god's not going to let me you know go through that and then especially the fire when he's talking about the fire when i go through the fire i will not be consumed okay now we just read that god is a consuming fire but god, god already got the ultimate sacrifice he consumed everything that he needed to consume through jesus you will not be consumed in the fire. You want the fire of the Holy Spirit to consume you. That is, the, the Lord will do that work in you. Jesus is the burning man. Jesus also reveals this. Luke 12, 49. Luke 12. I have come to bring fire on earth. And how I wish it were already kindled. So, so this is Jesus say, saying, I'm coming to bring fire on earth. I want to stir it up, is what he's saying. He is the burning man, the burning man on the cross, the burning man when he came to earth, okay? And he was the fourth man in the fire. All of this con connects. And then in verse 2, in Numbers 28, verse 2, God says, this offering is going to be a sweet aroma to me, okay? I'm going to show you how Jesus was a sweet aroma to God. Ephesians 5, 1 through 2, that's exactly what Jesus was, a sweet-smelling aroma when he was crucified. He was perfect and the ultimate sacrifice. Ephesians 5, 1 through 2, who has that? Jesus on the cross, Jesus being offered as a sacrifice was a sweet smelling Herses perfume, a sweet aroma to God. This is exactly what he was saying about the sacrifices and offerings being given. And then he said, at their appointed time or in its due season, in verse 2, chapter 28 of Numbers, verse 2, you have that phrase, in its due time or appointed time. There was a rhythm. There's always a rhythm to God. There are cycles to these offerings. There were certain feasts that he would be requiring them. A lot of it was through the number seven, which again, the number seven means perfection. And so Jesus was perfect. God has a specific time for everything. There's always a reason for God's timing. What they were seeing as why doesn't the deliverer come? Why? You know, just like when they were wanting to be rescued when they were slaves. God was working on Moses. God was developing Moses. God had to put certain things in history into place for them to be rescued, to be delivered. Well, now they know they need a savior. And so they're like, when is Jesus coming? We can't stand all of these laws, all of these rituals, all of these offerings all the time. 
and we need Jesus. And thousands of years go by, but God is aligning everything. He is setting everything up. Everything had to be, uh, all the pictures had to be laid out. He's painting a picture for us on the pages of history, okay? That's what he's doing through all of this. He's painting a picture for us on the pages of history. He is setting the stage. He is setting the stage for Jesus to enter the scene. He is doing the same thing with your life, okay? Everything in its due time, in its due season. He is painting a picture of Jesus with your life. We're gonna end with what this uh, verse here and I'm going to read it. I want you just to follow along. First Peter, and that's towards the end of your uh, Bible. Uh, after James, First Peter chapter 1, 18 through 15, I mean 18 through 25. I'm going to read it because I want to read it with a New Living Translation, which is, I like how it reads for this verse, okay? Everybody there? First Peter chapter one, 18 through 25, okay? Here we go. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which loses its value. It was with the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now, in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you have to come to trust. You have come to trust in God. And you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters love each other deeply with all your heart for you have been born again, but not for a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because, because it comes from the eternal living word of God. As the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And the word is the good news that was preached to you. Okay? The word of God is Jesus. In John 1.14, you can, you can um, uh, write that down. But John 1.14 says that Jesus um, became flesh. The word became flesh. Meaning the Word became Jesus. He embodied the Word of God. So anytime we are feasting on the Word, anytime we are learning and reading, what are we doing? We are taking, we are partaking in Jesus. We are feeding of Jesus. And Jesus is the Word and the Word is Jesus. They last forever. They will endure forever. Okay, that's why this needs to be going out. People need, because even now, eyes and ears are being opened. You have never connected the dots in this way. You kind of shy away from the Old Testament. You think it's antiquated, but it actually reveals Jesus and makes the reason you believe in him even more powerful. We're going to stop there. We're going to pray. Um, some of you within the sound of my voice may say, you know, I recognize it. I see it. I don't think I've ever made him Lord of my life. I don't think I've ever uh, surrendered my life to Jesus. I have not made myself a living sacrifice. Um, I want to tell you, you can do it right now. It's that simple. You just have to believe. You have to believe in Jesus. 
And that's the only way. He is the door. It is through the blood of Jesus that you can have a relationship with God. And then when you have a relationship with Daddy God, everything begins to change. But it's only through the blood of Jesus. And that happens by you repenting, repenting from your sins. You change your mind. You go another way and come to the Lord. Let's pray. And Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this moment. I thank you because I know in the spirit, eyes are being opened, ears are being opened, and people are realizing the truth of who you really are, who you were always meant to be from the foundation of, of, the, uh, of when time began, the foundation when the earth began, even before time began, even before the earth was created. You have always been and will always be forevermore. Father God, I pray that any fear, any panic, any nervousness, any anxiety, that it go in the name of Jesus. For we've not, we, we've always, we have always come against an invisible enemy. The invisible enemy that attacks us at our very core. He desires to kill us, but because you are our God, because you go before us, because we trust and obey you, you've got us, you've got us. And we know, Father God, that you, if you can be for us, who can be against us? So I thank you for that. And I pray for those that are coming to know you right now, those that are believing in Jesus right now, God, may they get, may they become good ground, may they start to learn and grow, may they, may they go pursuing after you. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this time and this moment. I ask that you bless this home. I ask that you, Father God, continue to grow us, continue to show us, and continue to reveal to us who you are. I thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. And Trent, can you? Thank you.